Uh, I'm uh, John Dotson, the director of the Global Taiwan Institute. Uh, we are a 501c3 think tank located in Washington, D.C., uh, focused on uh, contemporary Taiwan issues and U.S.-Taiwan relations. Uh, and we pursue this mission through a range of programs to include our fortnightly publication, the uh, Global Taiwan Brief, uh, available uh, for free uh, for reading on our website, as well as uh, occasional special reports that we do, uh, podcast series that we have, including um, uh, the Taiwan Salon, a uh, podcast focused on Taiwan cultural issues, and GTI Insights. Uh, we also pursue this mission through uh, a periodic uh, public policy discussion seminars, such as the, uh, the one we're uh, having today. So I'd like to thank all of you uh, for joining us this morning or this afternoon or evening, uh, wherever you may uh, happen to be in the world, uh, where we will be discussing today the prospects for cross-strait relations in 2023 and beyond. I think almost anyone would agree uh, that the year 2022 was a very uh, momentous year uh, for uh, Taiwan and uh, developments uh, surrounding Taiwan uh, to include uh, an increasingly uh, coercive campaign of uh, People's Republic of China uh, military activity, or coercive military activity directed uh, against uh, Taiwan, uh, as well as the visit in early August by U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi uh, to Taiwan and the uh, large-scale uh, military exercises uh, that the Chinese military conducted in the immediate wake uh, of that visit, uh, accompanied as well shortly after by the release of a new uh, official uh, PRC uh, policy white paper on Taiwan from, uh, from Beijing, which uh, further asserted um, in, in some ways in even stronger language uh, Beijing's claims of, uh, of sovereignty uh, over Taiwan. Um, and it also saw some noteworthy uh, political events and developments uh, to include uh, the uh, Chinese Communist Party's 20th Party Congress uh, held in October, uh, which gave to uh, Communist Party General Secretary Xi Jinping a, a third term in, uh, in office and perhaps may uh, have set him up to effectively rule for life. Uh, but definitely strengthening his uh, his position over control of the Communist Party and, and with it the all the levers of the uh, the Chinese government. Um, it also saw noteworthy elections, uh, not just in the United States in terms of the uh, the midterm elections uh, to determine control of Congress as well as uh, governorships and a number of other state offices, but also Taiwan's own uh, nine in one elections as they are called. Uh, which determine a, uh, a great many uh, mayorships and other uh, local uh, and, uh, and municipal uh, offices. Um, so there's certainly a great deal to, uh, to discuss today as we look forward to the year ahead and what uh, 2023 might bring in terms of U.S.-China relations, uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations, and relations across the, uh, the Taiwan Strait. Uh, between uh, Taipei and uh, and Beijing. So we're very fortunate uh, to be joined uh, this morning, or as the case may be, uh, later in the evening in, uh, in uh, Taiwan, uh, by some uh, very distinguished uh, experts. And uh, we have with us today uh, Dr. Chun Fang Yu, who is an assistant professor of political science at uh, Suzhou University in, uh, in uh, Taipei. Uh, his research interests include authoritarian politics, uh, party politics, political behavior in new democracies, and the trilateral relationship between the United States, China, and Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Chun obtained his PhD in political science uh, from Michigan State University, where his dissertation topic was on ruling party institutionalization in autocracies, uh, perhaps something with uh, direct relevance uh, to the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party, and our, our discussions uh, here uh, here today. Uh, his research has been published in a number of academic journals to include Political Science Quarterly, uh, the Journal of East Asian Studies, and the Journal of Asian and African Studies. So, Dr. Chun, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, we're also fortunate to be joined uh, by Dr. Uh, Chun Liang Yu, or Evans Chun, who is an Associate uh, Research Fellow in the Division of National Defense Strategy and Resources at the Institute for National Defense and Security Research uh, in Taipei, a, uh, an official or semi-official think tank, I think uh, affiliated uh, with the Ministry of National Defense uh, in Taiwan. 
Uh, Dr. Shun uh, received his PhD in political science from the University of California, Riverside, uh, and his research uh, and writing has focused on topics to include U.S. foreign policy, uh, Asia-Pacific regional security issues, and uh, Taiwan uh, defense issues. And in addition to commentary in uh, media outlets, his research has also been published in a number of academic uh, journals to include the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs, Eurasia Studies, uh, and the Review of Global Politics. So Dr. Chun, uh, thank you as well for joining us. And once again, a special note of thanks uh, to both of our uh, participants from Taiwan for joining us at, uh, at, at an uncivilized hour uh, beginning at, uh, at 10 p.m. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have the, the benefit of your, uh, your expertise and also your very kind willingness to, to do so at, uh, at such an inconvenient hour. So uh, thank you to you both. Uh, <clears throat> we're also joined today by Dr. Uh, June Teufel Dreyer, who is a professor of political science at the University of Miami, uh, as well as, I should note, a member of uh, GTI's own uh, advisory board. Um, in addition to her uh, current role uh, on the faculty at the University of Miami, she has uh, fulfilled a number of other roles uh, throughout the years to include uh, a senior uh, Far East specialist at the Library of Congress, uh, as an Asia policy advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations, uh, and also as a commissioner of the, United, uh, of the U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission, a uh, congressionally uh, mandated commission to research and report to Congress on uh, U.S.-China relations, uh, where I also uh, formerly served uh, upon the staff uh, a number of years back. Uh, so, Dr. Dreyer, thank you very much for joining us today, ma'am. I would, I would, I am waving to you, but you can't see oh. me waving. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, button says that it was looking for a WebEx connection to the video, and then mm -hmm. it informed me it couldn't find a WebEx connection to the video. So, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know what to do, but uh, at least I can't worry about having a bad hair day, right? <laughs> All right. Well, I do apologize for the uh, technical issues on that side of things. We will continue to uh, see if we can uh, troubleshoot that and uh, get that uh, figured out. Uh, so I apologize for that. We can hear you uh, just fine, though. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Scott Kastner who is a professor in the Department of Government and Politics at the uh, University of Maryland. Uh, Dr. Kastner's uh, research has focused primarily on the international politics of East Asia, uh, and he's the author of multiple books to include uh, War and Peace and the Taiwan Strait, his most recent book, uh, China's Strategic Multilateralism, Investing in Global Governance, uh, and Political Conflict and Economic Interdependence Across the uh, Taiwan Strait uh, and Beyond. Uh, he obtained his Ph.D. in political science from the University of California, San Diego, uh, and is also published in a range of, uh, of academic journals to include International Security, uh, the International Studies Quarterly, uh, Comparative Political Studies, and the Journey, uh, excuse me, the Journal, rather, of Contemporary China. Ah, and I see, yes, uh, <laughs> Dr. I, Dr. Dreyer, we see you, ma'am. I, I had the feeling that if I pressed enough buttons, eventually something <laughs> would work. And this always has the hazard that if you press the wrong button, everything disappears and never comes back. So mm -hmm. I am absolutely delighted to be with you. Oh, well, we're now thrilled I'll shut up you. and let you get on. <laughs> oh, no problem, no problem. I was gonna say to the uh, list of your uh, uh, distinguished titles, I think we can now add uh, IT technician uh, oh, to thank that. thank you. Um, by the way, I was planning to uh, Wave this. Uh, this is a book that we published earlier this year uh, with Jacques Delisle called Taiwan in the Area of Tsai Ing-wen. And it is now available in paperback, just in case you missed the hardback version. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, and, uh, and just in time for everyone to add to their uh, shopping list for Christmas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much. And glad we uh, we finally have the uh, the video feed uh, up and working. Um, I think without further ado, uh, I would like to turn to uh, to our discussion. I think I've done uh, enough talking, and I think the actually uh, knowledgeable people uh, should take over. And uh, from uh, from this point, um, I think in terms of our our order of speakers, um, I think I'm going to turn first to uh, Dr. Kastner, 
Uh, if you would, I think I will turn the electronic uh, floor, our virtual floor, over to uh, to you, sir, uh, for uh, for your comments. The the floor is yours, sir. Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, yes, yeah, I hear you great. Okay. Great. Um, thank you, John. Um, and uh, thank you to the Global Taiwan Institute for inviting me. I really appreciate this chance to uh, engage with you and to have a chance to kind of be on this panel with uh, such uh, well-known experts on Taiwan. Um, I just wanted to say in kind of my brief remarks a few um, things about kind of the big picture uh, in, in the Taiwan Strait and the U.S.-China-Taiwan relationship, and then uh, let the other speakers kind of speak to more kind of current events uh, and uh, recent developments. Um, so I, I think as John was noting in his uh, introductory remarks, it, it, it kind of goes without saying that um, that the relationship across the Taiwan Strait has been quite turbulent um, in, in recent months and in, indeed over the past several years, uh, as, as indicated most obviously by kind of the increased uh, military activity that we've seen um, by the PRC uh, around Taiwan. Um, and, and this in turn has led to, uh, I think, a growing sense among many that uh, the risk of military conflict in the Taiwan Strait is something that um, is, is, is growing. Uh, and we see this, uh, for instance, in, uh, in kind of media accounts of, of the Taiwan Strait. Um, so we've seen Taiwan um, become much more prominent in media outlets like the, the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, in, in recent years. Um, We've seen even uh, uh, magazines like The New Yorker and The Atlantic um, have kind of extensive uh, articles that have kind of probed uh, the risk of military conflict in the Taiwan Strait and some of the conundrums facing Taiwan um, that have appeared recently. Um, and, and so I think this kind of speaks to kind of a, a growing awareness of uh, a risk of military conflict in the Taiwan Strait. And it's an awareness I think that's really been uh, kind of put into focus by the war in Ukraine uh, which has kind of shown that um, uh, even among states that are pretty integrated into global markets uh, and that are, are fairly developed, um, war is certainly something that's not obsolete in, in today's world. Uh, and, 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 and we also see this kind of coming, this kind of concern about the risk of military conflict um, coming out of official Washington. Um, and so we've seen uh, high-ranking military officials kind of point uh, to, this, uh, to this danger. Uh, the then head of uh, Indo-PACOM uh, in remarks to Congress last year um, warned about kind of a risk of military conflict over the next six years or so. Um, the chief of naval operations a couple months ago um, uh, uh, kind of indicated that the risk of military conflict is something that's quite real, um, even in the near term. Uh, and, and the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, uh, in remarks uh, a couple months ago, um, kind of hinted at a, a growing risk of military conflict in kind of noting that um, he believed that uh, China under Xi Jinping is on an accelerated timetable uh, for, for dealing with the Taiwan issue. Um, so it's something, uh, kind of the risk of military conflict is something that's getting a lot of attention. Um, and, and I think uh, with, with fairly good reason, um, there, there, there certainly are kind of some, uh, some reasons to be concerned about uh, where things are going in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, most obvious, I think, is the, the rapid shift um, in recent years and the military balance of power uh, in the region um, and kind of growing Chinese military capabilities, uh, which mean that um, uh, to an extent that wasn't the case a couple decades ago, um, it's, it's possible to kind of imagine uh, a scenario kind of looking forward where the, the PRC could um, launch an attack against Taiwan with some kind of reasonable prospect of success. Uh, and, and there's also a reason to be concerned because of kind of political trends, I think, in the, in the PRC. Um, uh, Xi Jinping uh, has indicated on various occasions, um, I think, or at least given hints uh, to the effect that he views Taiwan as a priority and wants to see progress on uh, unification. Uh, and, um, and, and obviously, he's uh, uh, really consolidated power in the aftermath of the 20th Party Congress. Uh, and, so, um, and so I think that there, there, there's reason to be concerned. Um, and, and one thing that I really want to emphasize is that, uh, is that both uh, the PRC uh, and the United States, um, I, I think, are, are kind of look at the Taiwan Strait with um, some degree of pessimism and kind of how they kind of look at what's going on in, in, in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, so from the US perspective, uh, there's great reason to be concerned about kind of the shifting balance of military power and kind of some of these trends in, um, in, in the political sphere in China that I, that I mentioned. Uh, but from China's perspective, there's also kind of reasons to be concerned, most notably um, about kind of political and social trends in Taiwan. Uh, 
increasingly people in Taiwan uh, over the past couple of decades don't identify really as Chinese anymore. Uh, they self-identify as Taiwanese. Uh, politically, it's, it's kind of increasingly hard, I think, kind of looking, especially over the long term, to kind of imagine uh, uh, a candidate kind of emerging victorious for president who's really kind of seriously advocating for um, anything resembling uh, progress on reunification with the PRC. Um, and, and so um, I think there's reasons for, for Beijing to be concerned about um, where things are going in Taiwan, um, but also where things are going in the U.S.-Taiwan security relationship and kind of trends in U.S. security relations with other countries in the region. Um, clearly, U.S.-Taiwan security relations have improved uh, in recent years. Uh, Taiwan's gotten a lot of attention uh, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, and, um, and Taiwan's uh, increasingly kind of um, emphasized in other U.S. alliance relationships, most notably with, uh, with Japan. Um, and so I, th I think that the PRC is, is concerned about these trends. Um, and this kind of pessimism that we see, I think, in both the United States and the PRC about, um, to some degree, kind of where things are going in the Taiwan Strait, um, I worry kind of gives rise to what, what sort of looks like security dilemma dynamics, where um, both the United States and the PRC um, at times kind of frame what they're doing with regard to Taiwan as kind of reacting to what the other side is doing. Um, and so the United States often kind of frames uh, efforts to improve security ties with Taiwan or to kind of make Taiwan more central in other alliances um, as reacting to kind of a growing threat against Taiwan coming from the PRC as evidenced by um, not only the PRC's military modernization, um, but also um, the military activities that it's been undertaking um, around Taiwan, kind of frequent incursions into Taiwan's air defense identification zone, crossing the midline, circumnavigating the island with military uh, aircraft and so forth. Um, and so often these are kind of framed as kind of reacting to this kind of growing threat. Um, but the PRC sometimes kind of frames its activities as also reacting, um, especially not only to kind of what's going on in Taiwan, but especially uh, uh, what's going on in kind of the US security relationship with Taiwan. Um, and, and I think there's a great deal of concern about that. Uh, and, and, and so I, I, I am concerned about kind of the possibility of kind of a security dilemma dynamic um, and action reaction spiral kind of developing in the Taiwan Strait. Okay, so I think there are reasons to be con very concerned um, about uh, the risk of military conflict and kind of uh, the risks of kind of increased um, or con continued hostility in, in the Taiwan Strait. Um, but I wanna kind of conclude my brief remarks by just kind of emphasizing as well that I, I, I do think that um, uh, there are reasons to be at least somewhat guardedly optimistic about um, the ability of the parties to avoid military conflict. Um, I, I do not personally view conflict as at all inevitable. Um, and I think that there are still very powerful stabilizing forces at play. Uh, most obvious, I think, is the, the, the reality that um, a military gambit by Beijing would, remains an extremely kind of um, risky proposition uh, for the PRC. And I think the war in Ukraine has kind of really illustrated how risky um, that could be. Uh, it's, it's very likely that the United States would become involved in some way uh, in a conflict. And uh, that means that it could escalate with unpredictable consequences for, for the PRC and, and certainly the possibility of kind of catastrophic military outcomes. Um, and, and more broadly, I, I think it's really important to emphasize that all three parties, the United States, China, and Taiwan, um, continue to have uh, a, a pretty significant stake, I think, in, in, in maintaining some semblance of stability uh, in the Taiwan Strait. Um, even though we've seen this kind of deep rift emerge in U.S.-China relations uh, over the past several years and kind of some steps toward decoupling occur um, between the two economies, including the trade war, um, it, it remains the case that, uh, that the two the two economies continue to be highly intertwined economically. Uh, the PRC continues to be highly integrated and dependent on access to global markets. Uh, Taiwan is highly integrated into global uh, markets and is kind of still critical for kind of key uh, key component uh, components like uh, most obviously advanced semiconductors. Uh, and and what this means is that I, I think a, a war would be um, kind of catastrophically costly for for all three parties. Um, and, and I do believe that this continues to act as a significant constraint on conflict. So I'll just kind of uh, stop there and, and turn it over to the other presenters. So thank you.
All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kastner. I think that is very helpful uh, in sort of helping to, to frame some of these issues in, uh, in a larger sense. And uh, I, I took away from your comments, uh, well, I mean, there's, there's a number of questions that, that occur to me, um, but particularly, I'm, I'm really interested in this, uh, the sort of the, I would say the, the underlying fundamental dynamics uh, underlying uh, either, uh, you know, uh, problems in cross strait relations or uh, the, the fundamental uh, problems between China and the U.S. in terms of security competition. And, um, and again, this sort of this question is to, you know, are we or are we not locked into uh, a future of, of, of conflict or confrontation because of these uh, this sort of the under, underlying fundamentals, the, the tectonic plates, I guess it is, or is there a way to, uh, to look past that? And, you know, are we either locked into, again, as you referred to it, you know, an action-reaction cycle in a more immediate sense, uh, or even stepping back from that if there, if there is indeed a Thucydides trap? as is often invoked uh, between the U.S. and Ch uh, the United States and China. You know, is that genuine or, or, or not? So, uh, but again, perhaps something we could uh, get into a little bit more in the uh, discussion or the Q&A uh, later. And with that, I, I wanted to pause for a moment to uh, say to, uh, once again, to give a note of thanks to uh, our audience uh, watching online. And uh, to remind uh, all of you that you too are part of this uh, conversation. Uh, and after our uh, panelists have had their uh, their chance to to speak with their introductory comments, we will be turning uh, to uh, questions and answers uh, later on, uh, for which we would uh, very much uh, welcome your uh, your participation. If you do have uh, questions uh, that you would like to direct to our panelists, you can either enter them into the YouTube chat room if you are watching on the the YouTube live stream, or you may uh, email questions as well to uh, contact at globaltaiwan.org. Uh, Again, contact at globaltaiwan, uh, all as, as one word, uh, no periods or underscores, globaltaiwan.org. So uh, please do so, and we will look forward uh, to your questions. Um, so um, I think I'd like to turn next uh, to one of our um, participants uh, from Taiwan. I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Chun Liang Yu. Or, or Evans Chun, as uh, many of us uh, uh, know him, who I had the chance to meet briefly uh, early this year on a visit, and who I believe was a, uh, a previous uh, research uh, a fellow at, at GTI for a time, uh, I believe. Uh, but uh, once again, Visiting we're a very... scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. Visiting scholar to GTI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, uh, so I think I'm going to turn the uh, the virtual uh, floor over uh, to you, sir, for for your uh, for your comments. So please uh, take it away. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John, and also thanks for the uh, invitation from uh, GTI. Uh, the topic assigned to me is to talk about the uh, security dynamics uh, surrounding Taiwan. So today I will focus on three dimensions uh, of China, uh, the US, and the Taiwan. And actually, uh, as I discuss uh, the factor of China, perhaps, you know, is highly related to the US. So definitely, I will talk about, you know, the position of the United States, and then move on to talk about uh, Taiwan. So uh, let me focus on uh, uh, the situation after the CCP's uh, 20th uh, Party Congress in uh, October. I think uh, during the conference and after the conference, we can see Xi Jinping's power is much more uh, stronger and uh, more powerful. Uh, I think that's also more uh, concentra uh, concentrated uh, rather than before. So that means that the CCP or uh, the PLA or uh, Xi Jinping, they might be more active and more aggressive uh, toward the Taiwan issue. So let's look at the um, uh, personnel uh, or the uh, position assignments for the uh, uh, Central Committee of the CCP. We can see uh, Zhang Youxia, is still the, uh, uh, the member of the uh, political bureau of the Central Committee of the party. And definitely, he is the deputy uh, chairman 
of the military commission of the <clears throat> central committee. And the new one, and also the second one, we can see Wei Weidong. He is also the second member of the uh, political bureau of the central committee of the party. And uh, he was the former uh, commander of the uh, Eastern uh, Theater Com Command. So, uh, media, international media uh, analysis mentioned that, well, look at this, you know, position assignments. You can see uh, Xi Jinping definitely had the ideas to put uh, the PLS uh, top rank officers in the political arena. So that's one. And the second one, perhaps we can uh, look at the issues of uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Well, I have two, pi uh, two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, uh, if Russia is much more uh, successful in the Ukraine uh, battlefield, we can imagine that China or Xi Jinping might be more encouraged and will be more uh, uh, willing, active to invade uh, Taiwan. And hypothesis two, if Russia is, you know, uh, unsuccessful in the Ukraine battlefield, and then I might argue that China will be more conservative uh be more careful to conduct its plans of you know Taiwan invasion. But I think it's still hard to say because when Xi Jinping sees uh the failure or the fault of Moscow's you know in the Ukraine uh battlefield and Xi Jinping or the PLA will consider that perhaps they don't have too much time they don't have that kind of you know, opportunity anymore because you know the Western world and the, the US they consolidate, they uh, allied together uh, much more and more uh, compared to you know before. So it might be you know uh, oppositionally you know uh, stress up or speed up its plan of Taiwan invention. So it's hard to say. So at this moment, I think we definitely over the past weeks, we can see the Ukraine side seems uh, uh, to be more uh, successful uh, in the battlefield. So I still cannot, you know, make a conclusion or summary of how Xi Jinping or how, you know, the PLA uh, really calculate their uh, their opportunities of you know the plan of Taiwan invasion, so it's still very uncertain. And let's move on to look at the third factor of China side. That's you know China's military modernization. I think that's kind of you know uh, consistent because Beijing considers uh, its opportunity to win the United States is to through its military, you know, uh, modernization and keep going on developing its, you know, uh, naval power. So I think that's the key. And we call it internal balancing in IR theories, which means that, you know, Beijing or China look at its own uh, military capability to uh, conflict or to confront with the United States. And number four, I look at, you know, uh, China's relationship with the U.S. or we can say, you know, that's U.S. attitudes uh, toward the situations uh, in the Taiwan Strait. I think uh, over the past weeks, uh, over the past years, the U.S. is definitely, to me, preparing for the, you know, potential uh, conflict in the Taiwan Strait. But still many, uh, analysis or media uh, arguing that, well, actually the U.S. is not, you know, well prepared for the potential conflict in this trade. So I think it's still debatable. It's still controversial to me. To me, I still can say, well, I can say 
On the one hand, the U.S. is definitely preparing for the potential conflict. But on the other hand, the U.S. is still, you know, keeping to talk to China on the other hand. So we can see C and Biden, President Biden and the C, uh, they met, they talked in G20. And later on, we can see like the art uh, was that a deputy was uh, assistant secretary of state for East uh, Asian and the Pacific Affairs, Daniel Crittenbrick, and the senior director for China uh, National Security Council of the White House, Laura uh, Rosenberger. They just went to uh, visit Beijing this week and to promote uh, State Secretary Blinken's uh, visit to China next year. So we can see, well, the U.S., you know, on the one hand, still preparing for the potential conflict, and on the other hand, uh, keeping its engagement with China. And we also can see, you know, that's an advantage, or that's a big advantage for the U.S. to emphasize its allies such as, uh, you know, the relationships with Japan, Australia, Canada, and the UK. So I think Washington continues its efforts on, you know, uh, em uh, emphasizing, enhancing its uh, capability, capability of the uh, allies. And recently, probably we can see, you know, AUKUS maybe will plus uh, Japan in the future. So probably I cannot agree with that, you know, some media mentioning that, you know, the U.S. is not uh, preparing, probably is not preparing very well for the potential conflict, but I think the U.S. is doing something. Okay, let's move on to the uh, Taiwanese side. Well, in my observation, I think, uh, well, some of my American friends and also uh, friends who serve in international media uh, question me that, you know, they question that, you know, if Taiwan is really uh, determined to self-defense or not. Uh, to me, I think the DPP government or the President uh, Tsai Ing-wen, under her leadership, I think over the past years, Taiwan definitely um, showed its uh, determinations to reform uh, some uh, military agenda. But to be honest, in my observations and also to my you know, uh, friends who serve in uh, international media, they probably will say, you know, it's still not enough. It's still not fast enough for Taiwan to conduct, you know, the military reform. And that's kind of, you know, uh, probably, you know, Taiwan's, you know, uh, determinations to, of self-defense is not strong enough. So that's another issue. And uh, Number two, I think we can see uh, the U.S. or the Biden administration still continue arms sales to Taiwan. Just on December uh, 6th, uh, the Pentagon also approved the seventh uh, arms sales uh, to Taiwan. So I think over the past years, militarily, politically, economically, I think Washington definitely promotes a lot uh, it's a support to to Taiwan. Okay, and then number three and then number four, I will focus on Taiwan's uh, domestic politi politics related to uh, military issue. One is about the uh, extensions, you know, the issue of extensions of the military service for Taiwanese people. Uh, I think that's part of Taiwan's domestic politics. And uh, 
it's very controversial and very political to the people, to the nation, also to the uh, international society or to the U.S. Well, under you know under this kind of circumstance, definitely we might uh, argue that that's correct to extend uh, the period or the the the, the years of military service. But it's still very controversial or it's still um, opposite to some of Taiwanese politicians or Taiwanese uh, political parties on the islands. So what's the main reason of the you know, debate on this issue? And then we can move on to look at Perhaps uh, the KMT or the opposition, they probably don't agree with or, you know, uh, support the extension because that's kind of, you know, uh, 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 aggressive signal to provoke Beijing. But for the DPP, as I, you know, talked to some of my friends in DPP, they they told me that they do have the concerns of Taiwan's security. They told me that they might also have kind of pressure from the uh, from Washington. So they try to promote, try to extend that, you know, the military service. So still, it, you know, it's it's kind of you know political debate between the blue and the green. And number four, I will talk, talk about, you know, just, you know, the local elections on November 26. What the results of the local election, perhaps, you know, Beijing will be, perhaps Beijing is or was happy with the result. But on the other hand, I think Beijing would not be very happy or will be still unhappy because Beijing considered that uh, the blue or the KMT, the possibility or the opportunity for the KMT to take power back in 2024 is still question, questionable. So the local elections uh, 2022 Perhaps that that's a happy you know result for the KMT, but it's not always happy with Beijing because Beijing still have its concern about the uh, presidential election in two thousand twenty four. So it's still hard to say, but definitely we can see, you know, Beijing still conduct its you know uh, societal social. Uh, influence, economic influence, and the political influence, media influence uh, over the island. So that's still very challenging beyond the military for Taiwan's uh, security. And finally, I will talk about, you know, supply chain. Well, we can just see, you know, the TSMC uh, just had its opening ceremony at uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the week before. So I think China still conduct its, you know, kind of uh, fake news or uh, social media influence to uh, argue that, see, that's kind of de-Taiwanizations of Taiwan's high tech and that create or gener uh, generate another, you know, debate or controversial issue for the Taiwan Taiwanese public or the Taiwanese society. So to me, probably, you know, the US and the Taiwan or the democracies have to consider uh, how to uh, counter attack against China's kind of, you know, sharp power or the uh, conduction of the fake news or the, you know, influence of social media of democracy. So uh, that's my observation, and I stop here. 
and I look forward to uh, the Q and A. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chung. Uh, you've certainly given us a, a great deal to uh, to think about there, and again, a very uh, sort of comprehensive overview of uh, the different security issues affecting Taiwan um, and affecting Taiwan and U.S. relations. Uh, in regards to that, I mean, something I might be curious to ask you a bit more about or to draw out a little bit more in the, the Q&A is well, a topic that uh, I personally find to be of great interest, which is the uh, sort of the the dynamic of uh, sort of you know discussions between uh, U.S. Uh, and Taiwan uh, defense planners and, and and scholars and commentators, and some of the the differences of opinion or perspective that sometimes appear to be present, and some of the the frictions that that, that um, may uh, may create. Uh, but again, so, something I might perhaps try to draw out a little bit more in the, the Q and A because I'd be very interested in hearing your your thoughts and uh, and, and perspectives uh, on that. But once again, uh, thank you, uh, thank you for your uh, your comments. Um, I think uh, next I would like to turn um, amongst our speakers to Dr. Dreyer, um, who has uh, both uh, a long um, uh, career uh, focused on uh, the study and analysis. Of, uh, of elite politics uh, in the in the PRC and within the the Chinese Communist Party, uh, a, a great deal of detailed research on the um, the PRC political system and, and how it operates, as well as uh, I believe a recent uh, extensive commentary on the 20th Party Congress uh, that was published through the Foreign Policy Research Institute, uh, and which uh, I read with, uh, with with great interest. So, and I'd be very much interested. Uh, in uh, hearing uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dreyer's uh, comments on the um, the 20th Party Congress and other recent uh, political developments that could uh, affect all these, um, uh, again, the trilateral relationship between the, the U.S., China, and, and Taiwan. So, Dr. Dreyer, I think uh, I will uh, turn the virtual floor uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dotson. I'm pleased to be here. And uh, Professor Chun, you've given us a great deal to think about in your commentary. And uh, one of the threads I'd like to pick up for a moment before we get to the 20th Party Congress is to what extent Ukraine is a model. And uh, you raise the hypothesis, number one, that Russia wins. I would say that train has left the station. Russia has not won. and. I cite as my authority uh, the commander of the British forces on page one of today's Financial Times. And he said, Russia has lost. It is running out of ammunition. And, uh, you know, of course, it's very difficult for somebody like Putin, who has a very healthy ego, shall we say, to say, OK, I'm out of here. But he has run out of ammunition, whereas many, many countries continue to supply Ukraine. And the initial objective, and I regret to say one of which was shared by our military experts here in the United States, was that it was all gonna be over in a week. Putin was going to install a puppet government in Ukraine and the annexation would be complete. Now, having said that, um, is Ukraine a model for China, looking at that. Is it going to see this as a deterrent? And I think the answer is they're saying we can learn from this and do it better. And second, pointing up the differences between Taiwan and Ukraine. Uh, for, and this is not always to the benefit of Taiwan, because what happened, and I'm not sure this has been in, in the papers very much, journalists tend to concentrate on what's going on right now, but the United States military has been quietly, not secretly, but quietly training Ukrainian military since 2014, ever since the annexation of Crimea. And uh, the Ukrainians are eager pupils. 
They also have a number of Russian model weapons, some of them manufactured in Ukraine, and they are very good at maintenance. Whereas in this situation in Russia, you have the Russian military below the ranks of the top generals is not very enthusiastic about the war in Ukraine. And Russian maintenance has always been awful. And you've seen that with tanks, the treads are coming off and things like that and sloppy repairs. So the PLA is doubtless saying that's not going to happen with us. Also, the uh, Russian military is low. It's getting conscripts. The conscripts are ill-trained. They are unenthusiastic about going into battle, even when threatened with being shot in the back by their officers. They are eager to defect. And uh, this is probably not going to be the case with the PLA which in any case has unlimited manpower. So in that sense, the situation is very different. And now what about, okay, in Ukraine, Russia can invade across the border. Not so in Taiwan, but not to the advantage of Taiwan. Um, the Taiwan has been neglecting its military for decades and decades. The shortening of the period of, for enlistment is shockingly low. And particularly when you're dealing with more advanced weapons, you need more time training them. And this is just not happening. And in a way, one of Taiwan's enemies is its high tech economy, because there are better jobs in high tech than there are in the military. And another issue is that if the PLA, if the decision is made to invade, the PLA um, has big advantages. If you look at the two coasts of Taiwan, the major ports are all on the western side, i.e closest to China. The ones on the eastern side are smaller. They have a limited capacity, and we would no doubt that the, the Chinese could impose a, a, a successful blockade on the western side. They would have a harder time on the eastern side, but the ports of, on the eastern side, Suao, etc., are not capable of absorbing what is needed to sustain Taiwan. And furthermore, once you get there, let us say you got the equipment in, you have to get it over the mountain hump to the western side of Taiwan, and uh, that is not going to be easy. So uh, uh, military experts think that Taiwan, uh, I'm sorry, that China would be able to sustain that blockade indefinitely. Uh, I am not a logistics expert. So I have to take what they say on faith, but they sound to me as if they know what they're talking about. The other problem is that um, the United States, like a number of other powers, has a very fickle public opinion. They're in there swinging at the beginning, and the longer something goes on, the less enthusiastic they get. And I'm now, a number of my friends who are staunch conservatives, are saying, how long are we really going to stick with Ukraine? I'm shocked by this. Ukraine is not Afghanistan. We should have got out of there long ago. Um, but I'm shocked by what they're saying. And could they say the same thing about Taiwan? The other thing is the shocking level of ignorance that goes on. I have actually heard people say, at least one person say, well, the PLA could carry out a surgical strike against Taiwan and nothing would happen to the computer chip industry in Taiwan. That, ladies and gentlemen, is ridiculous. No such thing as a surgical strike against Taiwan. 
that would not hurt that the semiconductors. And naturally, uh, Morris Chang, who is a very, very smart man, it was my privilege to meet him when I was a commissioner. Uh, he knows what he's talking about. And so um, dispersing to a certain extent or diversifying the production to Arizona is a really good idea. And um, however, the high end chips are going to continue to be made in Taiwan. And uh, that is a good idea, just in case the United States should turn fickle. And you can see whose side I'm on here. Uh, and so again, a very iffy proposition but one in which a lot of Americans don't seem to understand and in which our journalists are not properly educating them. Now, uh, uh, again, I agree with Dr. Chun. There have been some steps toward taken toward preparedness. And uh, the chapter in the book that Jacques and I put out was written by York Chun, who knows what he's talking about. And he goes into uh, he's not exactly unbiased in this since he was in the government when he wrote it, but he is very astute and he points out just what a difficult road President Tsai has had because there's a lot of concern in Taiwan. Uh, do we want our recruits to be run ragged until they've dropped dead of exhaustion? That kind of thing. And we, uh, then another feeling, well, we can never catch up, we can never be what the PLA is, so let's not even try kind of thing. So I want to credit President Tsai with doing a lot, but it's not nearly enough. And now uh, the November of Taiwan elections, and I would caution here that what the PL, that the, what the Chinese say in public is, as you all know, what necessarily what they're saying to each other in private. And what you will see if you read the Chinese newspapers is, oh yes, you know, uh, the Taiwan voters have repudiated the DPP and its hardline uh, attitude. And it doesn't show a darn thing because public, that, that those elections were local. And they were not fought on unification, they were fought on local issues. Now, I also know, again, from my time on the commission, that the analysts, the guys you meet, and unfortunately speaking as a feminist, they were all guys, uh, once I met, were very well informed and very rational on whatever topic you gave them. So they know that the November elections were not a repudiation of the DPP or a repudiation of the uh, uh, hardline, uh, the quote, hardline DPP view. But are they getting through to the policymakers at the top? And this is the great unknown. Uh, Professor Chun, you mentioned a lot of things are unknown, and this is definitely one of them. Now, uh, since my time has probably already run out, uh, I will get to that 20th Party Congress. And when you consider, I mean, Taiwan was only a tiny part of it. And of course, he took a, she took a hardline view because he couldn't do otherwise. But look back at that. Uh, the real question in here is the August 9, 2022 white paper. And that was definitely hardline where in things that were in previous white papers just weren't there in the August 22 uh, one. Uh, it doesn't give assurances 